Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon now. My name is Brian Pitts, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Latin American Institute here at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, today, we're going, to the we're going to the second installment, a few minutes late, we apologize for that, of our Voices de América Latina, or Voces de Latino América series, in which we invite um, a speaker from Latin America, not necessarily an academic, although in this case, we do have a doctor with us, um, who is going, who will talk about um, their life in Latin America or as a Latin American here in the United States um, about some of the contemporary social, political, economic, and other issues that affect their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and those, and, the, and these discussions are, mo are moderated by a UCLA faculty member who proposes someone or in this, or in this case, a UCLA alumnus. Uh, we have Peter Lowndes with us here today as our moderator. He is a graduate of the Latin American Studies program right here at UCLA. Um, right here at UCLA and has long experience um, with the Brazilian community here in Los Angeles, um, impeccable Portuguese, and many contacts throughout Brazil. Um, he's gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker, Dr. Ana Carla Leidli, and then we'll go ahead and get underway with the conversation. So um, Peter, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, good welcome. Well, good, good welcome. Good afternoon, <laughs> welcome to this extraordinary, is it actually Women's Day, National Women's Day today? Yes, it is. And I've, I've invited I've invited a woman that uh, I I imagine that some of you already know, and if you don't, you're about to meet. And with no further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Anna Laidley. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, also for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, you know the theme, I, I have to say, when you sent me the email asking me and telling me about this possible, this opportunity, uh, when I sent to you the email back and say, I will talk about my triple invisibility, you know, the theme was, I, I was joking at first, huh. and later on, when you tell me, yes, that's an incredible theme, I was like, oh, okay, that's a wonderful, so, um, I, I am from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, coming from a family, uh, Afro, you know, uh, descendant family and, um, being the only daughter for my mother. And I think the second daughter of, uh, seven or eight kids, I say seven or eight because I have no idea, uh, all the, the history behind my father passed. So, and, uh, my father is Carlinhos Pandeiro de Ouro, who is uh, a very famous musician in Brazil. And my mother was a dancer. Early, you know, during my early age in my childhood, I learned really fast what was to be invisible. And the invisibility is belonging to an Afro-descendant, you know, family. And uh, in some way, hearing the stories about, don't go to that way because you're never gonna get it. Mm -hmm. Or this is not for us, or this is not for you. And I could never really accept that since I was an early child, because in school, became very early in life. I, you know, that was a place that I really could feel myself. And I was so happy. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, that you just froze for a can moment. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. The, the image is not catching up to the words at this point, but, but let's see if we can. Uh, Sometimes it helps to turn on and off, but I, oh. I, uh, I, we see you, you froze up a little bit. And as we've, what I'd like to say is just, when you talk about school, uh, you talk about public, primary school, tell, tell, contextualize a little bit about schooling in Brazil, because it's, uh, it's different than it is here. And some people may not understand, but uh, when did you start and where did you start going to school? If I can if I can ask that. Well, actually I started, I started going to school when I was four years old and it was a um, kindergarten and it was a private school. Okay, in Rio. And, but it was, the private school was in Rio 
it was where this first samba school was born. Ah. Then I was in Estácio de Sá. Okay. And uh, was very close to my to my you know, to my house. We used to, to live exactly on um, downtown where today is the the Marquês de Sapucaí, where the parade happened. Mm-hmm. I, I used to live over there very close. And uh, and the school was a private school, it was it was a Catholic school, and uh, it was a kindergarten school. Mm-hmm. One of the things that was very nice at that school, and I think I also have to thank my dad. When I get to school, I knew it how to 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 to, to read already, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because my father, my father used to do very traumatic thing with me. He used to say, "I'm gonna leave. When I come back, you need to know the ABCs." The ABCs. So the alphabet. When he would come back, yes, the alphabet. The whole alphabet. So when I, he, the whole I hope stayed away for a while. <laughs> and uh, and when he came back, mm-hmm. it was like all the time I make confusion with the E and F, M and N. Mm. So he would make me to start over, over and over and over and again. Mm. So I just know that at the end, when I started a kindergarten, I knew how to, to read already. So it was easier for me. But even though, I was all the time, because my age, I was all the time like, they want to hold me down because my age. Mm-hmm. You were young. So uh, when I, I was very young, I was very young. So when it was a time for me to go to the first, um, uh, first grade, first grade. So mm-hmm. I went to the public school mm-hmm. and that public school, um, Another incredible things happened to me too. I had the same teacher from the first to the fourth grade, mm. Mm. and the same cohort. Mm. So it was very easy for me. It was, you know, like, and this teacher used to love me. So the school for me was escape, was where I could be. But outside of school, I was the darkest kid within my my neighbors. And, uh, you know, um, my mother, my mother, my father was from the samba. So samba at that time was not seen as a good thing all the time. You know, my mother was a dancer. So that was a questionable thing too. So, but, uh, you know, I really learned really early how to be invisible. How do you do it? Well. One of the things is when we talk about invisibility, and that's it is what Black people have in Brazil, we still don't have a place over here. And I'm from here, I'm real right now. So um, we still don't have a place. We still don't see people with color really, really taking positions or, or you know, professionally, um, you don't just now lately woman being respected with the, as a professional, but it still is a struggle. I remember that as a child, you know, I would be all the. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
most of my friends were white. Yeah. You know, and most of my friends, uh, you know, the people that really my mother used to dance for, work for, that would have a little bit more money, they are also connected with white people. Right. So, so you don't really put yourself a lot in those type of uh, environment. But it was easy for me because I was very smart. And I used that intelligence and I used that to really to go through the system, you know? So the school for me and being smart became something that was like, this is what I can offer. This is mine, you know? And the concern about being all the time compliant. So, I think like learning with being compliant was a way of myself to be okay with invisibility. Mm-hmm. I do my part, so I'm okay. But did it make oh. you less socially, in, uh, did it make you outside of your class, of your cohorts, of the, the teacher, the Catholic school, outside that scenario, did, did your intelligence work for you in the community at large, uh, were you recognized as the daughter of famous people? No, this, in no. other words, it was a limited visibility, but limited you were very visible within that visibility. Yes. Okay. Yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, 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 and you know, and the funny thing was that I am the first and the only person who is still in my family have a higher uh, education degree. Mm-hmm. I bet. And, and, and you know, for me, um, education is something that nobody can take from you. Right. But I also, what happened when I came into the United States 29 years ago, of course, that I came, it was not a planned uh, decision like, okay, I go to the United States and that's my objective and that's my goal. I came because my father used to live over here. And I was in search of this connection with my dad because my dad being a musician and very famous, he was absent, Mm -hmm. you know, he was not there. So for me was like, you know, uh, not, not consciously, but I was all the time in search of that connection in search of that, you know, a bonding with my dad. And you came to Los Angeles Uh, first or did you go to? no, No, I went to Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes, yes. My father used to live in Hawaii. In so when I get to Honolulu, when I get to Hawaii, and this is a very interesting situation, it was I, I, I did not know where to go one day, and I got a bus, and uh, the the driver was a Samoan guy, and he said to, something to me, and I was like no English, and he started to really to speak. You know, in some mood, and I was like, "What?" And he's like, "You're not Samoan," <laughs> and I'm like, "No, I'm not Samoan." So one more time, I think that was a huge realization for me that, independently where I was, nobody can really know that I was Brazilian. Mm-hmm. You know, or I did not have a characteristic that I would say, "Oh, she's Brazilian." You know. What is that? And uh, I was I was really trying so hard to prove myself the entire time. And you know, I have done so many things as I, I came to the United States, but uh, I, I used to clean up houses and I went to like to be a babysitter, cleaning a house, take care of elderly, all this, you know jobs and inside me was all the time what am I doing over here I have a university and I went to school and and the way that I went to school in Brazil which was so interesting and this is also a part of being feeling invisible um, I left for the last minute to make the application to go to the university and in Brazil we have an entrance the exam of the entrance for the university we call vestibular right. 
Ou provant. So, yes. Mm. And as I was going in the line, the person told me, a friend of mine was one of my best friends. We went to school together. She was saying, what are you applying for? I'm like, I don't know. And she said, what? And I said, I, I don't know. And she said, do you know that today is the last day? I say, I, say, I know, I'm here for that, but I don't know. And she, she said, I, I'm applying for, for English. I'm applying, you know, I want to study. And I'm like, oh, letras, what are you going to do in letras? And she said, well, I can be a secretary, a bilingual secretary for you to see, like, yeah, 30 <laughs> something years ago. The, 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 the great objective was like to be a, lingual, a bilingual secretary or a Portuguese teacher or English teacher. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to do that. But in reality, Peter, since I was six years old, I wanted to be a doctor. And for a long time, I thought that to be a doctor was to be like a pediatrician or to go, you know, to the medical field. However, at the moment that I was there going to do my application, uh, I really thought my mother has no money. My father doesn't live in Brazil. I have no money. It will be difficult to really to pass. I was going, you know, I went to school, to public school my entire life. And I said, how am I going to apply for a medicine school that they had, they really demand a high score. I could not believe it that I, I could do it. So I did the, I did the test and I ended up getting the score that I could go to any medicine school, any. But at the time that I did the application, I just put over there Latin and Greek. <laughs> Latin so and Greek. Latin and Greek. So I went to, uh, you know, the Federal Fluminense University, UFI in Niterói. And when we started, we have 20 students in Latin and Greek, but everybody uses that application just to get into school and change to the areas that they want to go. And I was the only one that stayed there for four years. The school every year tell me, we give you any other place. Do you want a Spanish? Do you want an English? Do you want anything? And I'm like, no, now I just started, <laughs> now I finished. And Latin today Greek. I can read Latin, Greek, and Portuguese, yes. Uh -huh. And I would be like assistant teacher. I would be like everything for the Latin and Greek department. I did so many like, you know, internships and people like, what are you doing? What are you going to do with Latin? What do you do with the Greek? Mm -hmm. What do you do with the literature? And I'm like, I don't care. I just want to do it. I just finished. Mm -hmm. So I finished four years. I finished. And I think that today when I look back, it's because I do not want to be invisible or I want to be invisible because nobody, you know, would be pay attention to me or everybody was giving me you know, a lot of attention because the school was paying for teachers to give me private class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, nice. you, know, so you, got, you got a job. You never, you never lacked for a job. Period. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So no, but I mean, know, private I, classes and things like that. Did you find people studying Greek and Latin? Were there, were there such people? Because I know Portuguese, well, is, Portuguese is an amazing language because both Greek and Latin, it's very close. It's very yes. close. It's full of Latin words. It's full of Greek words. And structurally, it's not that different from Latin. I don't know about yeah. Greek because I, I never studied. Yeah, I, 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 as soon as I, le I left the school, I started to work with a lot of attorneys mm. because they need really to have all those Latin terms and understanding and you know, I, I would be really translating a lot of texts for them and, and doing that. And I started to be a Portuguese language and literature teacher for middle school and high school. Got it. You know, so, uh, and today I have to tell, to tell you, I don't regret at all because today um, when I'm so involved with, you know, Jungian, uh, uh, methodology, all that he used, the mythology, the Greek mythology, and all the symbology that is used, 
it's easy for me and I can really, oh, yes, I, I know that. So it, it's really something good. But what I, I'm showing you, trying to show over here, it's like this, you know, in Brazil, when I started to the university, a lot of my family and, you know, at the time I was married, my ex-husband used to say that I was going to school so I could have a little job and I couldn't make my nails, pay for my nails and pay for my hair. Ah. Was not the value of being a professional, not a value to really to be, you know, somebody that is the first person being, you know, going to university or, or really working hard to change something. Mm -hmm. So, and feeling invisible also made me to be an activist because of here in Brazil, you know, I, I, I participate in so many big marches over here for the election to be directed and all the people to really to be able to, 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 to vote. I was there. For Lula, I was there. For the right of women to breastfeed, I was the part of the, you know, the La Leche League. Mm -hmm. You know, to really to make the woman to be more conscious about it. You know, you have it, what your baby need. Because Nestle was coming over here in Brazil and really taking over with all the formulas and make these poor women from the favela principally to think like they will not have, uh, you know, what their kids need. And, and you know, so we, we did so many marches. We did so many things over here, participating in so many you know, um, act activism over here. So, but when I, I moved- to a moment, here, Anna, and, just, and yes. just say that I know how fast the hour goes and I don't want you to, we don't want to miss where you once again become a dancer and where the, the international samba kind, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all of that stuff that you're doing in Los Angeles is pretty mm -hmm. important also, as is your career as a psychologist and what you're doing there. Yes. So I don't want to short those things. So I'm mm -hmm. here to sort of persuade you to maybe mm -hmm. jump cut a little bit and go to some of the things that are actually happening now that we can talk about and that we can join with you in. That's great. Oh, uh, well, you know, come over here, I stayed, it took me about took me about eleven years to go back to school and get my master in education. In this, and in in, in, a, in in the U.S. or in Brazil? In the U.S. Uh -huh. And it was I, I went to Boston University and I got the master in education, um, master degree in education and in community com, uh, community counseling. That's when I started to be like, oh, okay, uh, uh, I will go to counseling. So Were you living in Boston or did you do it long range? I was living I was living in Boston at the time. Mm -hmm. I was living in Boston. And when the, you know when I finished the school, uh, during the school and another trace of invisibility, one of the teachers told me, despite you Brazilian, you're very smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking yeah. that he was giving you a compliment, right? I think so. And I was like, you know, and I told her. Sure. Well, I, I speak with accent, but I don't think with accent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and but it, this was one more time that I was really thinking most of the time, what is to be Brazilian? What is, what are the Brazilians over here in the United States? And the Brazilian is still very visible. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have any, any uh, uh, political representation, but you know, if you go to Somerville, if you go to Framingham in Boston, in Massachusetts, you know, it's entire Brazilian. Yeah. But uh, we don't have, still, we don't have like huge representation, a uh, political representation over here. So, a lot of people from Governador Valadares in, in yes, Cambridge, right? Yes. A whole community, because yes. everybody was related. They started working in restaurants, they brought their cousins, they brought their, you know. That's, yeah. I've heard that it's a, a very Mineiro, I you know. It's very, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. What it is make us also very, very like isolated, yeah, because I'm from Rio, I'm not from Minas, so there right. is this thing of, oh, you know, different ways of, of dealing with. 
people, but uh, um, I feel like, you know, what I have done since I came to, to America, um, I, start the, I start teaching Samba. Mm -hmm. And I started really, you know, teaching Samba at the University of Hawaii. And after that, uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I started with a men's center at the Brazil Brazil Cultural Center. And in 2006, I was teaching and somebody just told me, it's incredible that you is one of the most incredible dancers over here, but you don't have anything. You don't have like a, a, a group, you don't have a dance performance. You don't do anything. Uh. And I was like, wow, I'm invisible again. <laughs> And, and that's when I started to really dance as malandro, dance this male energy that everybody has, it, all the woman has inside, but is invisible. So we don't touch, we don't connect. Mm -hmm. And I started to really to dance, not as a man, but dance my male energy, my male essence. And mm -hmm. it started with that. Suddenly, I just saw the explosion of the manifestation of Malandro is so many other women's, uh, women and the women really like started to feel comfortable because the Malandro, you all dressed up and you have all this, this you know, you, you dress like a man. And, and this was something that I did not expect it. So I became this reference that people tell me, you gave me the way of expressing myself and continue loving Samba and, and really dedicate and without feeling like I have the pressure of using bikini or be doing the other aspect of Samba. And, and, and with that, you know, I started really to travel with a man and a man Santo was the one that really started to take me to Australia, to Japan, to every trip that we used to do it. And I was invited, you know, um, I was invited for so many things and, and, and so many events, uh, capoeira events that mostly is very, you know, a focus for men. And here I came dancing, teaching women and men how to dance samba and be able to, to really to be connected with both energies. So, and with that, I continue dipping my studies in, in psychology and work for, you know, uh, uh, agencies um, and opening up my private practice. But something was missing. Something was missing. I was missing something with my identity. And I started to really to think about it, to connect with people from Brazil more and more dancers and artists. And one day I sat down with Rodrigo Marquez and Patrick Carvalho and, I, and they, Patrick asked it, if you have to do something for Samba, what would you do it? And I say, a Congress. Because my idea, it was to bring the academia and Samba mm -hmm. because my, my uh, uh, dissertation is about the healing power of Samba. Mm. You know, so mm. and that's when I started to really to see I cannot be invisible anymore. I'm invisible because of woman. I was invisible because I'm a woman, black, and professionally, or I mean, even in academia. You know, some people is asking, "What do you do with the samba? Why are you teaching at the Brazil Brazil Culture Samba if you are a doctor?" And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> because I'm a doctor because I teach over there." <laughs> right. You know. And and, uh, and suddenly we, we have this explosion of people supporting, um, daring, uh, believing, and be a part of this huge movement that we are doing right now. And that's one of the reasons that I am here in Brazil now, because this year we do not have the carnival and I'm doing a carnival online. And the way that we are doing the carnival online is we are explaining to people. And yesterday the session was so emotional, so beautiful, because we are explaining to people each segment of a samba school, how the samba school work. And we are bringing people from those segments to really to teach. 
And yesterday we, we started with the Mainha do Shu, Rosangela Silvestre Mala from Bahia. And she explained to people, uh, putting the clothes and explaining how you dress yourself as Baiana and why the Baianas, you can see all those Baianas in all Samba schools. Entire, every Samba school in Rio de Janeiro has a segment that only for Baianas. Ah, and that was beautiful. Ah, 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 ah. Yes. And that was a beautiful thing because people could see where this comes from right. to what it is today. Mm. You know, and we have the Ala da Baiana da Mangueira. We are here doing everything, all the all this, you know, we are doing at the Museo of Samba. Wow. Where is yeah. that located? Where is the Museo of Samba? It's, it's very close to the, the, the Mangueira Hill. Okay. So we are we are in the community nice you know and uh, we did the porta bandeira master sala we did the bateria uh the theme of the carnival is favela mm. and we we have a a a, a more a, a module you know like somebody create a favela mini favela you know for us yeah so uh we have comissão de frente so tonight is the porta bandeira master sala Tomorrow we're gonna be Rainha da Bateria. On Thursday will be fun for the costumes, you know. Friday we are doing bateria and uh, we are doing uh, um, uh, passistas. And Sunday we're gonna have this huge show with everybody who participated at the Quadra da Portela. Wow. And this, yeah, is, so, this, is, this is being transmitted here. There are people from Los Angeles also participating in this, or this is something that you're gonna use later in segment. How, how, how does this work? It's live now. How yes. Is it yes. also going to be documented Recorded. and, and yes. made available? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and also we have people from Finland. We have people from Japan. We have people from Italy, okay. Spain, all over the world. All over the world. And people just like really crying with us, very emotional. And, and no one, no Brazilian say we're missing something. We're missing something. It's not about the carnival. Yeah. It's, it's about the impact of this pand the, no, so the pandemic. The pandemic. Yeah. Yes, impact on several, several levels. So, Peter. So you're doing it on Zoom and you're doing it uh, presentially in person? Yes. Oh. Yes. Wow. And people yes. when you're presential are people wearing masks? Some bundle? Are, masks? Yes, yes, yeah. we are oh, we, we are using masks. We are wow. using masks, but at the same time, it's not like everybody together. It's each day we have an artist each hour. So it's kind of right. people leave, the other people came in. So it's, it's like that. Yes, yeah, a segment. Could uh, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. Uh, no, no, no. It, and, and, and that's, I think, is what makes when you feel that you have this, you know, uh, uh, invisibility makes you to work harder. Yeah. Because you want to work harder, but also create, you know, when I started to have a, uh, 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 to be conscious about it, that visibility also is, you know, brings some vulnerability, yeah. you know, that's how I understood that I was okay with the invisibility because I, I want to protect myself and, and, and deal with the vulnerabilities. But of course that, you know, my point over here is like how women, as a woman, we tend to do more. Yeah, you have a baby, you have just two months to stay home with the baby. So, but uh, you have a baby, you work, you go to school, you, you raise the kid, you know, how women really tend to be doing more. And that's exactly because I feel like we don't want to feel this invisibility. You want to reach there. As a professional, you know, so many times, I, I, I work with the big nonprofit organizations over there in Los Angeles that only when the, I quit, I wouldn't know like people say, oh, you're such of a good therapist. You have, but during the time I was there, I was feeling crap because nobody really offered me any, any, you know, other position than just being seen Hispanic clients. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Do I understand? And you were pigeonholed. Time... You were pigeonholed. You were typecast. Yes. You were, you know. Yes. 
and also every time that we would come like with some idea, maybe we should think about the Brazilian population. What? Mm. Oh no! So we don't have still, Peter. We don't have a place that Brazilia can go to have that medical. You know, mm. they have their uh, uh, mental health. We don't have that. We're talking about Los Angeles now. Los Angeles, yeah. yes, yeah. we don't. No clinic, no Portuguese. No clinic, clinic. no Portuguese clinic. No, no. Mm. Still now here and there, I know about one gynecologist that it is in a hospital, I think in downtown LA. I know about two dentists and one vet. Mm. Mm. But you know, for a population for how I don't know how many Brazilian we have in in Los Angeles right now. How, would but, you guess? Would you guess? What would what would be your what would be your guesstimate? And then I'll tell I you. I have no I, idea. I think I, have no I, idea. I think more. I think more between forty and fifty thousand would be my guess. Okay. That okay. would be my guess. Not it's not even an educated guess. It's an intuition because intuition. I know that there was twenty five or thirty thousand years ago, and I think yeah. the community is growing. Would you not agree? Yes. I agree. I agree with that. You know, and I'm seeing more and more now some people that when you put a Portuguese mental health worker over there, yeah. it's popping some names more than when I started 20 years ago. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. and I'm glad with that. I'm really glad. But I also, I have dealt with a, like when I was looking for a therapist when I got to Los Angeles. Um, uh this person told me that she spoke portuguese but she was from argentina and she could not it's, it's not that she really spoke portuguese it was like uh, this yeah you know, like the portoñol yeah. uh, 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 <laughs> I, I think i even may know who you're talking about but let me let me tell you something that that occurs to me luis camara cascudo the great the great what sociologists have, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as a whole thesis about the Brazilians. He says the Brazilian people, in terms of emigration and immigration, that they can go anywhere in the world, and they're and they have what he calls chameleon instincts and chameleon aspects. He said, a <laughs> give a put a Brazilian in Sweden for a year, year and a half. He'll speak Swedish. He'll be mm -hmm. as Swedish as anybody, you know. He may look a little <laughs> different, but he will adapt. He will he will blend. So mm -hmm. is not part of the invisibility, perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps the ability mm -hmm. to blend, the ability to to get along. That that mm -hmm. thing that you know. I I don't know. It 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 always because the Brazilians that I know are multiple multi multifaceted. They do mm -hmm. several things. Katya, mm -hmm. the first one here, and now you. I think that what one of the things we're putting uh, putting forth here is that Brazilians adapt and they make the best of situations, including some of the most difficult situations on earth. And yeah, but one thing one thing that's a very interesting thing also, you know, when and, and this is 19 years ago. I was when I was in, in Boston. A lot of Brazilians never would be responding the census, mm. and the ones that would respond would put white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we started a huge campaign over there to say put other and put a Brazilian. So they started to see that you know we need, we have the needs you know. Yeah. And 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 yes, it's, it's still I think I agree with you about. The, the we, we have this uh -huh. resilience and we have this way of really to adjust and to adapt really easily Dandungi. but we all the time we all the time we all the time you know i have a friend of mine that she all the time is like i can't believe it i can't believe it. every time i talk to you you are you know like doing feijoada or you're doing like the international Suba congress or you're doing like you know your thesis you all the time doing so many things <laughs> and i tell her i'm afro latina that's what we do yeah. don't talk with afro latinas about not working and not change the hair we're going to be doing changing hair all the time don't talk about all hair <laughs> don't talk I about think... you know, I think it may be time almost to read your poem. I don't want people to miss out on your poem. Oh 
my no. gosh, okay, but it's so long, but it's okay. Well, maybe just a, um, in, or, or read a part of it, you know? Yes, okay, okay, let me just- It's in Portuguese. Here. It is in Portuguese. And I, and I want people to get the, I'm sure that there are many Portuguese speakers watching, and if you're not Portuguese speaker, dig the language, the musicality, the sound, <laughs> and don't worry about the sense right now. Okay, okay hold on, hold on. Well done, Peter. I have it here on my lap, but I can't give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, okay, hold on, I have it over here. Okay, so. A little bit of the I have over of here. The what what made oh, what led you to re, to write this poem, which I love? What it was, um, I had this. Uh, I'm having this uh, lives with the Brazilians, and uh, it was with um, you know the person who works at the Institute of Abidias Nascimento. Oh yes, I know that. I know that institute. <laughs> and uh, I started to work. Um, you know, uh, with him and the live was so beautiful and it was so profound. And I just like sat down and I started writing right away. And I said, wow, this was so inspiring that, uh, you know, I started to, to write and, and this, this came, this, this beautiful, I, I think it's beautiful. It's not because of mine, but I think it's beautiful. <laughs> And, uh, and and usually I write and I don't show anybody, but that was like, I, I want to show this to people because I feel like this is a very beautiful way of myself finding myself and not be scared of being visible anymore. This is you, you know, I would even say that this is you coming into visibility. This is you claiming, claiming yes. your inheritance, your racial, your, 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 everything and saying, I'm proud of being who I am. And what better way mm -hmm. to, to jump into visibility than to do that? So I, that's yeah. why I think it's an important document and should be read. Yes. The record. Okay. This is for the record, Brian. This is for the record. <laughs> okay. So Afro-Latina, que sorte a minha ter nascido Afro-Latina. Cabelos crespos, lábios grossos, bunda grande, canelas finas. Não só tenho orgulho da minha aparência, como também da minha resiliência, e se tem alguma vaidade é por minha inteligência. A melanina da minha pele carrega mensagens genéticas de um povo que soube se renovar. Um povo que, mesmo torturado, teve a honra de se levantar. Foi muita dor, muita raiva, muito rancor e humilhação, mas a sagacidade, essa foi a maior herança para a nossa emancipação. Emancipação. O meu pranto, que antes era um lamento, hoje corre pelos quatro cantos do mundo. É um ponto, é um toque, uma ladainha, é uma oração. É um porto seguro onde meu corpo e ser inteiro se eternalizam como uma canção. O sangue que corre em minhas veias é uma amálgama de plasma de mulheres sobreviventes, guerreiras, batalhadoras, cozinheiras, lavadeiras, lavradoras e arrumadeiras que já foram chamadas de negrinhas, feiticeiras, mucamas, macumbeiras, mas que curam almas como verdadeiras benzedeiras e curandeiras. E com isso nos ensinaram a sermos dignas, poderosas e verdadeiras. Eu sou afro-latina. Assim como tantas outras mulheres, sangro, sangro, tenho TPM e emoção. Tenho pela minha vida e uma nação. Somos mulheres que têm vaidades, valores e uma grande missão. É, uma das, umas são mães, todas são filhas. Outras professoras, domésticas, advogadas, médicas, psicólogas, presidentes, economistas, prostitutas, jornalistas, cientistas, poetisas, artistas, maestrinas, que passavam pelas brechas de uma sociedade desigual. Tanta luta para vencer por mérito, mas, na verdade ainda não estamos no pedestal. Constantemente somos uma ameaça para os conservadores da mentalidade colonial. O meu corpo embala exuberantes movimentos, um gingado cheio de sentimentos que confronta a visão machista a qualquer postura racista. Ouçam, ouçam o som, o som do tambor. É um louvor, é um chamado. O meu corpo em movimento 
é a natureza em seu elemento, um sistema de poder racializado. O clamor do meu rebolado, dos quilombolas, dos quilombos e quilombismo, são os passos arriscados, que, são a, que, que nos afastam do colorismo. Tentaram lavar a minha mente, dizendo que a beleza que o mundo queria ver era a esbelta, dentes cerrados, cabelos lisos, pele branca e osso que a minha beleza, apesar de um colosso, era um tanto exótica, visceral. Ele sentiu tanto medo que um dia tentaram me dominar e usar-me como um animal. Pensaram que eu não sabia distinguir a minha sensualidade da minha sexualidade e como usar o meu poder de escolha. Disseram serem enfeitiçados pelo meu poder de sedução. Esse corpo é meu e não quiseram escutar o não. Porém, desse lundu, não repetimos o refrão. Memórias escondidas, histórias de uma lida que já não me serviam mais, memórias tão vivas integradas em minha vida que os ventos vão soltar. Esses são os pontos de referências para que eu possa, para as minhas filhas e netas, ensinar e passar mais um legado e as armas necessárias que eles precisam para lutar. Lutar pela igualdade, pela proteção e preservação dos nossos ancestrais. Lutar contra o feminicídio. Lutar por suas posições e espaço na sociedade. Fazer com que as suas vozes sejam ouvidas. Sem que elas precisem se esgoelar. Saber que ser afro-latina não é só lavar roupas na tina. Porque sabemos que podemos mais. Somos seres inteligentes, sagazes e eficientes. E abuso já não aturamos mais. Sou um ser livre e arrojado que ama a vida, casa colorida e as sambambaias penduradas, um bom bife grelhado, quero esticar o meu corpo ao sol e tomar banho de, marga... de mangueira, uso temperos, especiarias, saias rodadas, pé descalço e cabeleira, sou afro-latina, que fala com sotaque, mas meu pensamento é fluente, que usa as línguas e diferentes linguagens para se fazer presente e gritar bem alto, bom tom, em bom em alto bom tom, ser afro-latina é tudo de bom. Epa! Yes! Thank you! Uh, thank you! The, the, next, the next time you read it, it's going to be to music, and you're going to do the music, <laughs> because like all poets, when we have a chance to write, to read our poetry, we generally go a little fast, because we think, oh, we got to get this over with. No, that, that's, that, that's a statement that First of all, have it, has, it, has it been translated? I, I, I fear to translate it, although I'm very moved to translate it because I'm not a woman, I'm not black, and I'm not Brazilian. But I know. apesar disso, eu estou por dentro. I love it. I love <laughs> you. And, and, and I think, Brian, uh, if we have any questions from audience members or people who may be watching, this would be a good time perhaps to ask them. If not, we'll go on. We have a comment. Um, don't have any questions per se yet, but um, uh, Rosana Isla says that um, this is um, that um, Dr. Lely is such an incredible person. is very passionate about what she does and where she comes from. I'm personally attending her virtual event, um, Is Carnaval, that part the participants can still sign up for. It is a priceless educational experience that breaks down each component of Carnaval, the history of samba schools, and truly highlights the aspects and importance of Brazilian culture. People can learn people can learn a wealth of information while attending these events. Wow. That's, wow. that's, that's Thank pretty you. nice. Sounds like something to sign that's, up for, doesn't it? Yeah. How, that's so good. Maybe, maybe you could do that, Anna, which is, uh, I know that there are people watching because I've invited a bunch mm -hmm. and, and maybe we could leave a document or two. Uh, I don't know. How, uh, let me ask Brian. Is, is there a chat that we could put things on or, or should Anna actually can, talk about put, this? I could put Just, links in the chat. Um, I cannot add files to the chat. Okay. So, well, I, I think that, that uh, I have a lot, of, a lot of questions. First of all, I wanna, I wanna say that uh, Anna and I met 20 some years ago, I think more, because of a, a, a friend of both of ours, Beto mm -hmm. Imarais, who came down yes. and, and was dancing in the park in the, in the studio that you had right near, uh, uh, what is the park called? My God, it's right here in the neighborhood. Uh, Leymar Park? No, 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 Leymar Park. The, oh my gosh. I, you know. <laughs> uh, 
is in downtown. Is that? <laughs> yeah, it was made famous by a song, Mac not MacArthur Park. Uh, my God, now it's, I'm blanking out. But anyhow, I met your father there, and I saw you as a choreographer, dance instructor. I've been part of several of your shows, and I want to say that it you bring when when you make a show. It is, in a sense, as as does Amen. It is a quilombo. It is a. It is a. It, you bring Brazil, and I saw, for instance, I I'll, I never forget that I saw Dion Warwick at your last show, and yes. Dion Warwick was as some people may not know about Dion Warwick's connection to Brazil. So why don't you say a few words about about what Brazil means to people? that we think of as famous people. I mean, I can have Letty Kravitz, Dion Warwick. Why do people, why do rich white and brown people go back to Brazil? Why do people go back to Cachoeira? Talk a little bit about that because I know you know a lot about it. The, the yeah, you know, uh, Ms. Ms. Work, you know, I, 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 my first encounter with her was through her uh, daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. Luana. Mm -hmm. that uh um you know we, we're talking and she said oh yeah you know this is my my mother-in-law and i'm like what and uh, luana was really talking about her experience because she she um met her husband diana warwick um son through the project that diana work does in brazil with the, the the over here in the hills with the kids at risk and Luana was part of that project and she met her in son Rio. In, the, in the project in, in, Rio. in the favelas of Rio in Rio in the favela in Rio mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and uh, I was like she does what and she said yes and her plan is her bleak plan is to retire to buy a house in Brazil she wants to retire over here she wants to live over here mm -hmm. so she lo she loves the people she loves the culture. She loves feijoada. And that's one of the reasons when we had the dinner, it was a feijoada because yeah. that's her favorite food. And, uh, and I just thought about it. Honor people that really has done something to the Brazilian community in Brazil and outside of Brazil. And that was the reason that we decided to invite her to be, you know, the person receiving that, that homage, you know, that day. And it was wonderful. It was a beautiful night because yeah, yeah. she was the guest of honor and the dancers came and, 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 and everybody, they didn't play to her, but they played in her honor. And she, yes. and it, was, it was an incredible situation. Downtown yes. LA, Dion Ward. Downtown, yes, and, and she was very, 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 you know, um, humbled and, and happy and amazed by the performance we put it together. So, you know, that night, I think the, I'm not sure if it is her manager, but the manager was like, we need to continue that connection. We need to continue, we need to bring this show, you know, but I, I think it's a very beautiful thing that also, you know, Kiss Jones come over here every year. Yeah. Kiss Jones is over here all the time in Carnival. This for him is like, he's, he's really, really in love with the Carnival in Brazil. So, you know, we, we, we know so many people that also the properties over here, the lands in Brazil is so cheap. Yeah. So people can, can really buy really, you know, like lots of and lots of properties over here. And I know a lot of American artists and celebrities, they, that's what they do over here. But the, the people over here, I, I, one thing I see with people, for example, yesterday, we started this event and Donna Neuma's granddaughter, you know, Neusi, Donna Neuma is the founder, is the daughter of the founder of Mangueira and mm. the first president of Mangueira, Marcelino. So, so Marcelino, uh, Donna Neuma is the first lady of Mangueira. She passed away, but, you know, her granddaughter, knowing that I was coming to the community, knowing that I was coming over here, prepared a feijoada for me and for the, the team that is working with me. Nice. So, you know, and go to a house that when I get over there, 
her mother was like, oh my gosh, you look exactly like your mother. My gosh, I saw you when your mother was pregnant. Wow. You know, and you used to sleep over here. Um, my mother not allow your parents to take you to the samba school because it was too loud. So they wouldn't leave you here sleeping and when everything. So it was, it's, it's something that, you know, we don't have that much of things, you know, um, outside of Brazil where people open up your house and say, eat, eat, come, come, come. This is my cousin. That's my, so everybody becomes a cousin. Everybody becomes a relative. It, you know, like it, I, I used to say to people, if you be around for too long, you, you're going to become like my my cousin, my aunt, my <laughs> my brother, my sister, because, you know, we, we have that connection. And I think like people miss us that people miss this a lot, you know, in terms of connection. I think well, like I think we live in a society. The night that I met you, the night that I met you, I came to your house with Beth That's and true. with my That's wife true. and we had dinner and I dinner. met some of your yes. kids. We haven't yes. talked about your actual family, but you have a family. Are you not a grandmother? I do. I, I, I am a grandmother. I am a grandmother with a very, I'm a very proud grandmother. I have two grandchildren, uh, you know, Maria Clara and Benjamin, seven and five years old. I have three kids, my 30 years old. She just moved to Brazil. You know, that's, that's when I saw you do I'm that incredible to. piece with the dancer. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's my middle child, Isabella. Isabella is the dancer. Isabella is the, the one. Uh, she, Isabella is over there in, in, in Los Angeles. And Giancarlo, who is 18 years old, so my boy. Wow. So, yeah, you know, uh, living in the United States for 29 years now, married for 20, I'll be 25 this year. So, you oh, know, my. and all the kids, all the three kids, practically like not kids anymore. Mm -hmm. and uh almost like adults almost like adults. yes almost <laughs> almost and you know and and, and peter one thing I, I tell people all the time is this you know um yeah. the passion the love I, I feel like renewed all the time when i'm doing something that makes me so connected back to my root you know and, and despite living in america I'm very conscious that even if I live over there for 100 years, I'll, all the time I'll be Brazilian. Yeah. So, you know, and for a while I struggled a lot thinking, oh my gosh, I live over here for so long, but look, I still have this accent. Oh my gosh, I still have broke English. And one day I just said, you know what? I speak English, I speak Portuguese, I pretend to speak Spanish, I can read French, I can read, but also, you can why do that. be like it's Greek? You know, oh, yeah, so I am going to be concerned about, you know, having my broke English. I still can communicate. <laughs> we're coming. We're coming to the end of the program, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And I call it a program because it is mm -hmm. to me a, an opportunity for for the people at UCLA to meet some people from the outside, from the non-academic community, from outside the campus. And I think that uh, I'm so happy that you were able to come from Rio. I had no idea you were in Rio, you know? Yes. From yes, Rio, yes. no less, and Carnival, <laughs> and that you're bringing Carnival to a country who's, anyhow, we'll talk yes. about this the next time. We did have yeah. one, one, last, one very quick last question, which sure. people asked and I wanted to get to. Um, they wanted to, um, a couple of people want to know what the title of the poem is again, and if it's available anywhere online. Ah. Oh, okay. Uh, is Eu Sou Afro Latina? And I can put, I, I just put it in my Facebook. I did not put it in any place else, right. but I, I can, I can definitely. Um, I don't know. I can send to you, Brian. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I send can send to, to you. Well, reach out to me and I'll get her permission and send it to you. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> International.ucla.edu. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. And thank you to both our moderator and our um, and our participant today. It's been a, a really fascinating, really fascinating, wonderful experience for all of us and really special today on International Women's Day. Um, thank you so much again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Boa tarde, boa noite. Boa tarde. Boa sorte. 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 Boa sorte